the Journal of Australian Political Economy, uh, as part of the process of linking up with the international movement that he finished by describing. And uh, I think this is uh, marvellous, although I must say, having taught in economics and political economy for approximately half a century, uh, I, I've seen it before. Uh, there's been waves of concern among economic students over a long, long period of time. There was one very significant wave, late 60s, early 70s. Another one, early 2000s, uh, associated particularly in France with the post-autistic economics movement. And of course, uh, now post-crash is another big wave. And I hope this one is going to be bigger and even smaller mainstream economics. But I think one has to be fairly realistic about these things. In fact, I remember in the first of those three waves, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, the distinguished uh, American political economist, said, uh, I hope as well as judge that uh, the current assault on neoclassical theory will prove decisive. <laughs> uh, well, he was wrong. He did it. Uh, it was wishful thinking. And I think it is important to try to disentangle uh, wishful thinking from uh, practical organisation and commitment. But uh, no doubt uh, you're very well aware of all those things. And uh, Christian has become quite well aware, I think, of the local scene in Australia because he's already given talks at Macquarie University, University of Melbourne, met the students at La Trobe University doing uh, politics, political uh, Politics, philosophy, and economics, who are very committed, like you are, to putting on your own courses if the uh, if the university curriculum won't accommodate it. Well, let's have the energies from the blow and do it anyway. And uh, on later this week, uh, Christian's also talking at uh, University of New South Wales and the University of Western Sydney. Part of that whole process of building networks and solidarity. Having made those prefatory remarks, uh, I'd certainly like to echo Christian's point about the question of relevance. Indeed, in my mind, it can be summarised in that little phrase, elegance or relevance. Uh, because I think there's little doubt that neoclassical economics is quite elegant. It's elegant in the same sense that mathematics is elegant. And for the practitioners, that's quite intriguing, because the test of one's work is not necessarily that it helps to understand the world, but whether it constitutes a technical advance over previous uh, bodies of theory in that area. But the pursuit of elegance, uh, somewhat inward looking process, because ultimately a subject like economics is an only of value if it helps us to illuminate the world and even to help us to change it for the better. And that's, of course, where mainstream economics falls down. Mark you, the annual award of the Nobel Prize, so-called, for economic science, uh, continues to go mostly to mainstream neoclassical economists. I remember one a few years ago, an economist of uh, French background, Gérard Debreux, who spent most of his uh, career in the United States, was accorded this high honour for tremendously abstract applications of set theory in, in economic reasoning. And uh, he came to the University of Sydney to give a public lecture a couple of years later, and he prefaced his lecture by saying, please don't confuse anything that I'm going to say by uh, questions about the real world. <laughs> I thought this was very refreshing. Because at least he was clear in saying that we've just engaged here in an intellectual puzzle. We're not actually using this directly to approximate anything that's really happening out there. I know that this year's uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Economic Science is paradoxically another French economist and also largely a theorist, uh, neoclassical tinged with game theory and formal uh, modelling. Aimed, sorry, 
times to provide insights into public policy to deal with market regulation. But it, its whole character, worth, thank you, which I'm largely ignorant, but about <laughs> which I've read, uh, it, it is very abstract theorized, with a strong emphasis on innovation in technique rather than in a more worldly uh, engagement directly. Why do I dwell on that? Well, as some of you may know, this year has seen uh, a tremendously uh, good-selling book around the world by Thomas Piketty, another French economist, called Capital in the 21st Century. Now, that has its critics, but no doubt, in terms of public impact, this is a major blockbuster. It's possibly the biggest blockbuster since John Kenneth Galbraith wrote The Affluent Society over 50 years ago. What's the chance of Piketty getting the Nobel Prize? Absolutely zero. The dominance uh, of neoclassical theory, uh, the engagement with elegance, with technique, is so hegemonic that even people who are engaged with the real world in critical, challenging ways that provoke widespread public discussion, media interest, are effectively marginalised. So that, I think, is the context uh, in which we continue to find ourselves in universities. Now, at the University of Sydney, uh, some of you may know, uh, some 40 years ago, a struggle began to challenge this state of affairs, Posters were produced uh, by dissident students, supported by then uh, young members of staff like Gavin Butler, who's sitting over there, and myself. Oh, happy days. Uh, and we actually did struggle uh, in a combined student staff movement against the professors, against the vice chancellor of this university, a struggle that initially was uh, about getting reform of the economics curriculum but quickly became transformed into a struggle for a separate program of courses in political economy and a separate department of political economy to administer them. Here's a group of uh, some of the demonstrators. Uh, right in the middle there, the guy with the, the vest on is Clive Hamilton, when he had beard and hair. He's now a distinguished professor uh, at the ANU. And there's a couple of other academics, I noticed, uh, so being involved in the political economy struggle didn't actually do any harm for their careers. It just took them along different tracks. But the struggle did grow throughout the early 70s. Uh, here's some other activists. This is incidentally is Anthony Albanese. Oh, did I just touch him on the screen? Yeah, take it back. The far side is Anthony Albanese. Uh, that photograph was taken on the top of the clock tower at the main quad. <laughs> which the students were then occupying as part of a, a protest in support of uh, political economy courses. This is another scene of an occupation inside the Vice-Chancellor's office. Uh, again, on another occasion, a rally was held on the, public, uh, on the front lawn. They went to see the Vice-Chancellor with a petition. He wasn't there. So they uh, went in anyway and drank the contents of his cocktail and uh, eventually left. Uh, here's one of the sitting on the window there at the back of the room. One of the student activists who went on to become a uh, professor of economics at Macquarie University and subsequently UTS. Uh, it's a collage. There's Gavin Butler, who's sitting in the second row of the far side with a, a somewhat younger me, and the then Vice Chancellor Bruce Williams, who opposed the introduction of the political economy courses. But you see, uh, who we are trying to be vaguely civil to each other <laughs> at, at a social event. He did say to Gavin and I on that occasion, it's about time we buried the hatchet, or some words to that effect. I, Desisted from saying yes, but uh, <laughs> preferably not between the shoulder blades. 
The other pictures in the collage show cops evicting students after an occupation of the Merriweather building. Um, various other uh, scenes from the era. Oh, and here's an article, you can't see it in this collage, obviously, but this one here, an article by Tony Abbott, former economic student at the University of Sydney, who went on to become a journalist uh, with the, the Bulletin a magazine before he moved formally into liberal politics. He was then the transition from DLP to uh, liberals at, at that stage, <laughs> and he took it the opportunity to denounce the political economy program at the University of Sydney as the work of subversive Marxists. <laughs> Nothing much changes, it seems. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the figure at the bottom is the distinguished uh, Cambridge professor, Joan Robinson, who came to the University of Sydney and uh, spoke in as part of our, our, our movement and gave considerable legitimacy by her public presence and involvement. Other scenes are of occupations uh, outside the, uh, the Senate room, uh, outside the professorial ballroom. Another one where there's a caravan carried on to the university <laughs> uh, front lawn uh, where we set up the Faculty of Political Economy. <laughs> 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 you can see there was a quite a good times having this process, but the, the punchline was clear that after years of struggle, the university authorities did decide that we could have a separate program of political economy courses, and many years after that, a separate department of political economy to administer it. And uh, since that uh, process worked its way through, some 15,000 students have studied political economy at the University of Sydney. Now, why do I emphasize that? <laughs> well, a, because I'm here, but B, because it is a highly unusual case. I venture to suggest, Gavin may correct me if I'm wrong, that this is the only university in the world which has such a comprehensive program of undergraduate and postgraduate studies in political economy existing as an alternative to a mainstream economics department. So this is a distinctive alternative to the internal reform process that uh, quite understandably Christian has emphasised drawing on his own experience. Thank you.